Welcome to Impact the World, the show for and about creatives, change makers, and entrepreneurs. This is a conversation episode where a special guest shares with me what they are creating and the behind the scenes journey of their experience. Welcome to Impact the World. And this week we have something a little different for you. This is actually a show where Regina Meredith is interviewing me. And this is something that we are bringing back from the vaults. When I released my book, Energy Speaks, in March of 2019, we had literally just moved into this very studio, literally like a week before. So the very first thing that we did was we launched the book with a live broadcast that was free to people who signed up. And Regina interviewed me about my journey as a channeler, about the book itself. And then she also interviewed my guides, the Z's. So I channeled. And we thought that it might be fun for those of you who haven't become familiar with my channeling work or the book to experience this interview. Regina is an amazing interviewer. And if you're interested in going deeper with the book, you can visit energyspeaksbook.com where you will find paperback, Kindle, and the audible version of the book itself. But for now, enjoy this show. Hello, everybody, and thank you so much for joining us for this special worldwide online book launch. And really, for me, a celebration because I get to bring the fantastic Regina <laughs> Meredith to, to join us. And um, yeah, I first met Regina, I think it was, we were trying to decide maybe four years ago. And four or the, five years ago. Four or five, right. mm-hmm. yeah. And for those of you who don't yet know Regina, she is what I like to call a master interviewer. And way more than that, she is a wisdom keeper. She has got so much knowledge about this world, the world of metaphysics, the world of consciousness. So I was thrilled when she agreed to write the foreword for Energy Speaks. And that's why I wanted to bring her in today to be with us. Well, this is a natural. We're just used to doing that. How many times have we done? We've done this a lot together. Yeah, quite a few. I mean, interviews. we've done it at Gaia quite a bit together. We've done that's it true. on Your my site. network together. Yeah, yeah. And so it's just a really easy rapport because I love what Lee's doing. I love talking to the Z's and we're going to do all of that today. Does everybody know we're going to be doing that? Yeah, I don't know if I've told you, but we're going to take some questions, not just a few questions from you, but Regina has her own questions about the book itself. And we're going to ask questions of the Z's at the end of the broadcast and see if they have a message for us too. So. Yeah, so I thought we'd ta- initially start talking about the phenomena of channeling and listening to that higher wisdom within. And that's for us individually and, and the process you go through, which is a bit more extreme than what most people do in terms of listening, right. because you're listening to... You're listening to a group of beings. What? How many of them are there? Well, Eighty. Yeah, the way they explained it, they said we're eighty-eight energies yes. that then extend wider into source. Yeah. And of course, we all do, right? Because we're all connected to everything. So that made sense to my brain. But they've they've referred to themselves often as a consciousness library. Right. And I think it's important to know that every one of us has our own guides. Mm. It may not be eighty-eight of them. We may have Uncle Joe, who we used to drink with down at the bar on Saturday night, who's passed over, you know, and a couple others. We have all different, I think, ranges of densities of guides that are working with us and trying to get our attention all the time. But probably even more so, which I wrote about in the foreword to your book, we have our own higher mind, soul complex, always trying to speak to us. And that's the one that's, that's the kind of the holy grail is when we can tap in and really listen to that. But it's an art. It takes time. It takes discretion. One of the things I often talk about in relation to this is I'll meet people who will say things like, oh, how do I know I'm channeling my guides and I can't contact my guides? Right. And I'm always like, don't worry about your guides. Just sit down, piece of paper and a pen and write to yourself, what does my soul want to tell me today? And then just that command, that question, that inquiry, see what comes to your mind and start writing. And often people will go, oh, well, I did it, but it was just like, just said, you're great, you're a wonderful person. It was just like nice. And I said, well, are you normally nice to yourself? Because I wasn't when I first, you know, in my own mind, when I first heard my guides. So what they do is they warm you up and they calibrate you to the higher vibration that most of us weren't trained into either believing about ourselves or having as a dialogue with ourselves. True. I mean, if they 
didn't kind of step it down a little bit to where you already are, most people would be frightened or they'd feel insulted. Yes. <laughs> as you could have felt the first time you began channeling, right? Yeah. But it's funny, there was so much love. That yeah. was the thing. Um, and, and it's interesting because I don't think I was like the most stubborn person in the world, but I certainly wasn't the most amenable. Right. And so for them to kind of say, that's an interesting idea, but you're wrong, wrong. as the kind of first thing I heard and for me to suddenly pay attention, but it was, it was what they backed it up with. And it was as soon as they explained to me why I was wrong and how I wasn't seeing things, it wasn't just my mind that expanded, my mm -hmm. body relaxed. So right. any emotional tension I had about this thing that my ego was in a fight about, I just went, ah, oh. and that, that for me was the, the, the kind of acid test. Do you think the fact that you were getting that particular message, which was in disagreement with what you thought was going on, actually helped you begin to understand maybe it wasn't just your own thoughts? For sure, for sure. Yeah, because, the contrariness of it, yeah, really. The contrariness of it. And also, I, I literally heard the voice as different. Um, mm -hmm. It didn't sound like, uh, the best way I can describe it is if my own kind of, you know, dealing with my own thoughts kind of is like this and it's kind of like, you know, kind of like, eh. mm -hmm. this was, this was like something from an echo chamber. And I don't, I don't even mean in some spectral uh, out of this world way. It just was very clearly this other voice. And because I'd never heard it before and it was mm -hmm. so clearly positioned of course, at first you're like, is this schizophrenia? And that, you know, you go through that question, but then the more I spoke to the voice and the more the evidence was falling onto the page, this was useful. And the more I said to them, are you my guides? The, the clearer it started to get. And then I started to trust the relationship based on the teaching and how the teaching was actually changing me. And it still does. Yeah, and I think a lot of people ignore those voices. For example, they'll say, whoa, where did that come from? Mm -hmm. And they'll just think it was some random event, a random thought passing through their mind without stopping to really feel it. I mean, because I think that repetition of feeling, after a while, you knew that that tone of voice coming from about a foot over your head was your guide showing up. But if you don't take time to at least say, what was that and honor it for a moment, it's very hard then for, to start having patterns repeated that allow you to recognize when they're knocking on your door, so to speak. I love that you say that because that's still something I have to do to this day. So to this day, I will have an instinct about something and I'll, I'll be like, oh, phone Regina. <laughs> and another thought will go, oh no, don't disturb her now. She might be busy. Call, you know. And, and what I've learned to do is to listen to the first thought or the higher thought, but I, I, I'm not free of, especially it's not when I'm channeling, it's just when I'm going about my every day. And right, I think that's exactly. so important for people to understand that we have these intuitions. It's like, which voice do we listen to? Do we listen to the subconscious, the unconscious, the intuition? And, and it is something you have to train yourself to do. Absolutely. And <clears throat> you have to honor it. Number one, just say, I hear you. I hear mm. you. I hear you. And uh, you're right it is walking around life where it becomes problematic because, you know, you're, you're driving your car, so to speak. You know, you're not in a sublime state necessarily yeah. day to day when you're walking around. And so when that voice is speaking to you, it's always trying to um, intrude, not, not, not intrude, but make itself known amidst everyday life. And so you're right, just taking that pulse for a moment to say, oh, maybe I need to honor that feeling. We all do it. We all run right yeah. over them and say, God, I, I felt that before yeah. we took off today and made this road trip that this thing was going to happen. And there it is, you know? So I agree with you, the subtle, um, that having that discretion to listen to those subtle feelings, subtle voices and get and honor that even on a day-to-day -day basis, I think is what really strengthens it. Yeah. And the voice of the body too, because not everybody is auditory in the way they channel. Yes. But I just literally, uh, just this last week had, a, had another lesson about listening to my body um, which was, I'm, I'm getting much, much better, but there was something I agreed to do that my body was telling me no, but my desire to do this with this person, and I knew they were enthusiastic about yeah. it, so I kind of went with it, and my body was telling me no, and then a week later, I kind of had to listen to my body and back out. Years ago, I would have done that thing to my own detriment, so I, I also really believe that the wisdom of the body, and yet for me, and I think for probably most people watching, it's a constant learning and a constant refinement and a constant evolution. So some people don't hear things, but the other thing I love to teach people is do the body test. If you're not sure what your intuition would say about something and you can't get an auditory, um, an auditory answer, go, okay, should I go to Italy? 
sit with that in my body for a few minutes. How does that feel in my body? Now, mm -hmm. should I not go to Italy? How does that feel in my body? And you want to go for the one that feels a bit more mm -hmm. open, a bit more energizing, but then be prepared that if you go, yes, I, oh my God, I should go to Italy, that when you book that flight and when you pack your suitcase, you're also probably going to go, oh my God, I don't know why I've done this. You know, right. it's like, because you're, you're moving your patterns and you're pushing against your programming. Absolutely. The body test is a huge one. And in fact, I witnessed something interesting one day where there was a, a neurofeedback system that was sophisticated in its day. The person was hooked up. They had the EEG and the EKG um, wiring in, and what do you call them? That The little uh, transmitters on the body that stick oh, onto the yes. body and onto the head. Anyway, they were hooked up to both machines and it was, they would have questions and then the being would react, the person would react. Um, on a subconscious quiet level, but it was always the stomach that was reacting first. The neuropeptides in the gut mm -hmm. were responding before the peptides in the brain, neuropeptides so in the sense. brain, and giving you that immediate response. So the whole thing about gut response is what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. The brain in the stomach, the, the brain intuition in the stomach. In the stomach. And, Absolutely. And, and, and I think it's important to work, work with both. But yeah. just going back to what you said about how we don't pay attention to these things, one of the things that we all have to remember, I went through this with the fear of channeling. Most of us did not grow up in either a culture or with parenting or teaching mm -hmm. that supported listening to our intuition. And I know a few people who did. It's amazing. They're like, oh, my grandfather was Native American. So he would say, trust yourself. So they had somebody in their life who was validating it. But for most of us, we grew up in a culture that our own intuitive power had been scrubbed from society. Exactly. We were told, no, you go to church, and if the priest says you can, or if the priest says you've sinned, we were all being asked to give our power out. Absolutely. And so I think that's why we, you mm -hmm. know, we often we don't believe ourselves, we don't believe it's real, we don't believe it's happening, and sometimes we think it should be more mystical than it is. And what I always say is, it's really, it's actually just down to earth. It's like going to the post office right. to take. It's all part of life, and I think if we can demystify it people start to own it more. I think so. And one of the things Aziz talk about quite a bit, and you have in your book, is the place of emotions. Because mm. that's we're talking about gut feelings, we're talking about thoughts, but the realm of emotions is what people have a very hard time contending with on this planet, this, yeah. this amazing place that's literally balanced between light yeah. and dark. And so the, an emotion is very different than just a gut level feeling. Mm. So explain a little bit of that to us and why they say we have to start taking on our emotions. Well, th there's a couple of things that I've heard them refer to over the years and that I've witnessed working with people is emotions are usually twofold. They are in a way, um, you could think of them as characters that we have created as responses to events, impulses, people in our lives that we then continue as patterns. But equally, um, emotional energy is everywhere. So you know how you walk into a room and you're like, oh, this, this room doesn't feel good. And you don't know why. It's like, did something happen in here? So there is a level of emotional energy on the planet that is a bit like an ocean and we're swimming through it, cold patches, warm patches every day. And they say that we have not been taught to honor our emotions. And if you look at you know, how we have this very distorted male, female patriarchy system that we've all come through, one of the gifts that women have, usually women in their gender, I mean, it's different for each person, but they have this gift of incredible emotion, incredible intuition. And men have been divorced from that. That's like, oh, scrub this out. So um, one of the reasons that the Z's say we have to listen to our emotions is because our emotions will tell us often the whole truth. And if you edit out the emotions, then you're only getting certain pieces of a person. So for example, if you were to come here and sit down with me and you would say, I'm really happy to be here, Lee, your words tell me one thing, but of course, you know, <laughs> but if you would sit here and go, I'm really happy to be here, Lee, yeah. there's two completely different experiences going on there. Yet I think because emotion is denied and we have been often trained to disconnect from our emotions, a lot of people are walking around the world going, I'm really excited, Regina. <laughs> and, and everyone else is kind yeah. of just accepting that. So what they talk about is the power of emotion on the planet. And they also talk about how we've all been discouraged away from it, out of it, taught not to understand it so that um, we're essentially living half life, which serves those who wanted to train us that way. Exactly. I agree with you on that. And it's also another spectrum of information. Mm. 
to be taken in and to use for your own discernment or discretion or decision making. And sometimes it can be so random. And I'm going to give you an example from this morning. I'm glad I spoke up because a lot of times I'll walk through spaces and I feel a lot. I mean, I feel every, I kind of pick up whatever energy is going on. And this morning I was feeling kind of like this and thought, wow, what's wrong with me? What's wrong with me this morning? I, I can't even think of a thought that would have had me feeling like this. And I mentioned it to Zeus. I said, I think there's something strange about the energy of the B&B we're staying in, mm. right? And looked out the window and was overwhelmed with sadness. Mm. And I thought, but I'm not sad, but someone standing at this window was there in amidst all this beauty and their, and wealth and they're so sad. Oh, yeah. And then I realized, no, we're sitting in a field of emotions that are still left imprinting this mm -hmm. place. And we can't often distinguish it from ourselves. And this is very confusing to human beings. But I, I love that you bring this up because you also add another point. So I know where you're staying, you're staying a little closer to LA in Malibu. And one of the things that I've noticed, because you know we've only lived here for two and a half years, is this is a really great place to get in touch with that um, spiritual hunger that exists in the people who have quote unquote made it. They're wearing the right outfit. They look good on Instagram. They might have money in a Tesla, but now they're at that point where it's like, uh oh, the externals didn't fulfill me, but I was working so hard yes. to do that. So you you see that paradigm here a lot, and it's yes. it's kind of heartbreaking. It is heartbreaking, and it was very, very heartbreaking to feel that because mm -hmm. we're in probably one of the top handful of places on the planet where someone would feel like I made it. Yeah. I'm looking over the ocean from my beautiful home in Malibu, you know, yeah. <laughs> seriously. Yeah. And I, I, but the point I'm making also is that I brought it up to Zeus and said, I don't know what's wrong. I just it's like feel out of sorts and off balance and kind of sad, but I don't know why. And he yeah. said, it's the place. He said, I feel it too. And that's where I think communicating on a very simple level, communicating our emotions. I thought, oh, I'm not crazy. It's not, mm -hmm. It's not, it isn't me. I didn't think it was. I have exactly what you're describing. And, 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 and I've got better at understanding that about myself. So I'm no longer tormented by it the way I used to be. But yeah. I, I, you know, and that's kind of why I really love finding a quiet place to live, yeah. having a quiet routine. And then of course, you know, you go off and you travel and you meet with people, but having that, and, and my husband is the same. We both love having quiet areas yeah. So that we can always return there if we have to go out into the frenetic world, you know? Yeah. And so you realize you have to have that amidst all of this. And this morning I was validated that, yes, there is an, an embodying emotion in this place at large, in this home that is foreign foreign to us and, and that we were absorbing. But we don't know the difference when we're walking through life a lot of times. When we're in the room with coworkers, someone has had a, a really difficult or challenging event happen that day. We the, learning the discernment, which I think is part of what you and the Z's do between what is yours and what you're absorbing. And we're going to get to that in a bit, because in the book, you talk so in good. several places about the beauty of boundaries, which a lot of people watching this yeah. don't have. Yeah. I don't have. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, you know, it's funny. I, I, I was so sick with, um, you know, if I look back now, I was so sick with self-judgment, self-criticism, self-blame like all through my teenage years and, and, and early on in my 20s. And I remember there was this moment when the Z's just, I think I was about 29, 30, and they were like, well, you realize this isn't you. And it was the first time I had even considered the idea of being an empath. And, you know, like a lot of words in the spiritual community were like, what is an empath? What does it mean? And of course, it's different for everybody, but it, it means you are someone who can stand in the window and be highly influenced and receptive mm -hmm. to the sadness versus someone else who's so focused on what they're doing or they're just not, their wiring isn't on the emotional plane. Right. They're, they're, they're here for something else. So for me, that was a game changer. And it's, it's amazing. One of my favorite things to do is to put that to people in workshops and go, have you realized this isn't just you? And I watch people's face go, huh? Oh, and it's, it's such a relief. It's a relief. <laughs> yeah. And then we have to practice remembering that. So one of my favorite affirmations from the Z's is, I release any energies and emotions that are not mine. And I swear, you can say that like 30 times a day. And if you leave a friend and you, you're like, wow, oh, I felt okay before I met them. And now I feel yeah. really tired. Just say, I release any energies and emotions that are not mine. Because it won't take away anything good about the interaction, but it will let you drop any of their right. energy field 
that you connected with because we love connecting but sometimes we connect with slightly dirty dishwater and that's not anybody's fault that's just where we they're all at carry it around from time to time yeah right exactly we all have it too yeah and part of your discernment process via the disease has been to learn the difference between your thoughts and feelings that mm -hmm. was a really big one because where they come in conflict with each other is like the person saying I'm fine, thank you. I'm having a lovely day. You know, and you're having your thoughts and feelings are at, at counter at, at odds with each other. Yes. And so talk a little bit about that and then we're going to go into some of the categories in the book. Well, it's still an ongoing process yeah. for me as I think it is for everybody because I feel like you just get to keep leveling up mm -hmm. around what you're healing and what you're repatterning or what what new pattern you're inviting yourself to. Um so again, this is this is why I say to people when you do channel write these things down because it's very hard when we're in our sphere to just go is this a thought? Is this an emotion? Is this an instinct? So if you can't write things down, say things out loud. So for example, let's say you have a thought that you notice, oh, that's not going to go very well. And you've just developed enough awareness that another part of you goes, is that the truth? Is that my instinct? Try saying it out loud and see how it feels. It's not going to go very well. Hmm, that feels a bit off. That doesn't feel open. That doesn't feel like it's connected up here. That feels very much my body. That feels very much my history. That feels very much my fear. But equally, you can do the same thing to reprogram your thoughts. So this is something I practice. If I say something, if I notice something negative going through my subconscious, I'll say the opposite out loud. Oh, you look awful today. Oh, you look great today. It's just a complete. So, so yeah. for me, that's Start kind of been the, it. It, and I think that's the best kind of advice I can offer around that because we're all so different. We're all, it's so personal, mm -hmm. but the best thing any of us can do is to experiment with ourselves and, and pay attention to the experiments we conduct. It's why when I wrote all that channeled material down, I could go back and look at it and see that it was working. So there's always got to be one logical part of us assessing our progress to kind of help cheer us on. Yes. Now let's get to the book itself. Okay. okay. So first of all, I mean, we'll start a little bit for those who may not know about you and your childhood. I'm thinking a lot of the people watching do, you're familiar with Lee, but some people are new to your work. But first let's talk about the title, Energy Speaks. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? Well, because I, you know, honestly, that's probably the biggest truth of my life. And it took me a long time to understand that. And if I feel like if I could go back and understand that energy is speaking all the time. So there is an energy in this room. There is an energy between us. Um, there is an energy in the trees I can see outside the window. Then I wouldn't have tried to deaden my senses in my childhood to try and cope with the overwhelm of the energy everywhere. Because no one was saying, oh, energy is a thing. There were certain things I was told were things and no one was talking about energy. So um, that's where the title of the book came from. And, and really Thank the Z's you. are energy too. So it's... Absolutely. Uh, yeah, it's, yeah. And your life started out energetically very, very sensitive. And you were kind of a chubby little kid. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. And uh, you were sensitive. You wanted to express yourself artistically. Yeah. You wanted to go into acting. You realized at a fairly young age you were gay. Mm. And then you bring up in the book this one uh, scenario in which EastEnders, a popular British show... <laughs> <laughs> that um, there was a gay kiss in the show yes. and the public was outraged, mm -hmm. right? And I was watching the show with some family members and I remember um, I remember them going, oh, at the screen. Now, don't get me wrong. I always try and reassure people that like when, because we're not used to seeing that image, all of us would have had a bit of a strange reaction when well, we first Well, because it was new. It, it was, was new, new in the same way that I think six-year-olds sometimes look at people kissing it. Oh, you know, yeah. it's just a reaction. But that informed me. It was like, uh oh, I'm a problem. Who I am, mm -hmm. who I'm feeling. I'm, I'm. I think I'm this. But okay. of course, I wasn't exploring that verbally because it wasn't talked about. I would be told, oh, when you have a girlfriend, when you have a wife. So I was like, uh oh, this isn't going to go very well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So. And then, okay. Conversely, you watch the Oprah Show. Oh. Okay, and this was big. I mean, I think it's fair to say that British society tends to be a little more repressed emotionally. <laughs> having so polite. Uh, yes. I've spent a lot of time <laughs> I know. there. I know. <laughs> tends to be a bit repressed. Oh, yeah. Um, and wonderful at humor. 
Mm. Wonderful at deflecting emotions mm -hmm. through oftentimes very cynical and biting humor, yeah. for example. Yeah. I mean, that's kind of a hallmark of yeah. British humor. Yeah. And it's clever as can be, but oftentimes it's to deflect pain inside because you can't just express your emotions yes. freely. So you ended up watching the Oprah show. And, yes. and now how old were you at this time? I would have been 16 or 15 because I was revising for my GCSEs. And I remember that I would reward myself for revising by going and watching the Oprah show. And, you know, now we know Oprah as someone who has Super Soul Sunday and she's very, into, she's a champion of spirit, the spirit and spirituality. But back then she hadn't started any of that. Yeah. But what she was doing, she was talking to the audience members about their life. And they were telling her stuff, like they were talking about how they felt and their challenges. And I was just like, what is this? Because this is real. This isn't a movie where right. the emotion is being driven for you to mm -hmm. feel. This is like people talking about real stuff. So I was just blown away and I was glued to the screen. And, and I that was around the time, at that point I was 60 pounds overweight, but I was taken to Weight Watchers age 10. So I, I know a, you were one of the youngest dieters I've heard of. Yeah, I yeah. know, I know. So, so, Aww. so, um, addictive eating yeah. and destructive eating were very much my pattern. And, um, so this was around the time that I started to lose 60 pounds. I was a lot yeah. smaller too. Um, but I, I credit the Oprah show as being one of a few key aspects of my life where suddenly emotion and feeling was allowed to be expressed and not repressed. Right. And that was kind of the beginning of my healing journey. And then comes the year 2000. Mm. You know, you now you're starting to engage in some of the the pot human potential movements of the day, right? Yes. Yeah, so um, I didn't know that at the time, but I was taken to a workshop called Psychology of Vision, um, and I'd been, you know, I'd gone to a couple of shamanic workshops and gone to some yoga classes. I was definitely looking, but Psychology of Vision was great. It was a place where people were workshopped through what they were feeling and what they were needing to move. So they were really pivotal for me. And in 2000, you realized in this one workshop, your path wasn't going to be as a professional musician. No. And was this initially kind of disappointing or heartbreaking well, at all? You know what's funny is I didn't really realize. I think I was, so just to give the context of the story, um, the, the workshop leader, Chuck Spezzano yeah. said, for those of you who are willing to have a bigger purpose in life and give up your plan to God. Mm -hmm. Come up here and you're going to be the ones who say, God, use me. And you're going to surrender your plan. Um, and, you know, a bunch of people ran to the front of the room all excited. There were a bunch of other people going, oh, that's not me. I'm not doing that. And then there were those of us in the middle. I could see both sides. I wanted to be happy like them. But I was like, well, I, I know I want to be plan. a singer-songwriter. Right. The irony is that being a singer-songwriter was me giving back to the things that had helped heal me. I didn't even think working in spirituality was a thing. Um, so I thought I'm going to use my voice and what I write and what I create to give to other people what has helped me heal. And of course, the irony is that that day I did say, God use me. And I think it was six months later, I did my first reading, my first session that I was encouraged to do by a friend. But it was only years later, I looked back and saw that that was the moment when I kind of gave up my plan. How did that feel? Especially, I mean, it had to be daunting, the notion of being an intuitive, oh, a professional oh, intuitive, complete. how vulnerable. Oh, I yeah. mean, you can be ridiculed. And then I want to know how your family and friends reacted to that. So here's the thing. It's like, great. You're the fat kid that you can't ever escape <laughs> because people look at you a certain way. It's yeah. not like when you're gay, it's like when you tell someone, or if you're very obviously gay, but as the fat kid, you just can't, you walk into a room and you see people look you up and down, look at your size. So, you know, I lived with that for years. Um, and then you have to come out as gay. So the last thing I wanted to do was be the weird channeler. So I didn't tell my family and it was only a year and a half into like doing all these sessions and um, having to explain why I was running off with my laptop every time that I came home to visit them because I'd have this, this queue of people waiting and I had another job. So I kind of told them tentatively and they, my family are great. They always support me and, and, but it wasn't their wheelhouse. So no, I was very, I was totally fine with it when I was doing the work, but all my buttons were pushed around the idea of social stigma or people, people not being able to just have a conversation with me about life because they had some idea because I was a channeler that I was different in a way that they separated from. Did you 
did you find at that time, okay, so first of all, you're finding that it's kind of separating you from people, but did you also find that, um, for example, your eating patterns and such started changing as you started embodying what your true purpose was in life? I, I think everything started to change. Yeah. And the first few years were kind of intense, mm -hmm. um, but no, everything started to change. And knowing that I had the ability to have that connection yeah. personally, but more so um, when I finally allowed myself to feel what was happening, you know, because I would get emails from people going, oh, thank you so much, you've changed right. my world. I just kind of didn't take them in. You're very right. British. Right, right. So I just kind of, you know, I was like, oh, that's nice, that's but nice. I didn't let it in. Yeah. And it was about four or five years in that I was like, wow, this is this is amazing that I get to have this intimate connection with these people. I was so focused on doing a good job for them that right. I wasn't. So it, it really shifted me personally to actually be in service to the work and still to this day does. And one thing you've learned, and you talk about this in the book, is that there is no one, just like the room in Malibu, they may have made it on one level, but something's not right there, um, that everyone has pain, every person, has pain and they have these childhood wounds that haven't healed and we need to learn to live alongside that mm -hmm. and become in, come into companionship with it and the reason that's so important for me <laughs> to share with people is because for so many years of my 20s i was going to workshops thinking they were going to fix me and i was going to permanently be healed and live a very uh, enlightened life and definitely to some degree uh, who I am now and what I live now is, is miles away from where I was stuck then. But through working with about, I think it's four and a half thousand personal sessions and people all around the world in workshops, whether they were the very well-to-do CEO or the parent that was happy because all, all they'd wanted was kids, there's always something. And even some of the most enlightened people I've met, if you're in a body dealing with the earth, stuff's going to find you. And it's not that that's the problem. It's, it's, it's learning how to deal with those challenges and lessons as they come. And I feel like that's what we can all lean into. We can develop a knowing of ourself and an ability to see this as a learning place and a refining of how we move through the world. That's what we can really lean into because we can't control outside forces, but we can actually learn to dance with them in a different way. I think so. And oftentimes in the, the human potential slash new age movement over the last 30 years, um, <clears throat> there's been a big emphasis on moving away from pain, mm. right? And I, we both, you and I both had the experience recently of watching the story of um, Osho mm. in, the, in the Netflix documentary series Amazing. called Wild Wild Country. And what was so interesting about it, this was the very beginning of this human empowerment movement. It was kind of the beginning of the hippie days in the, in the very onset of it. But here you have groups of people who are looking to leave the, the restrictive nature of their lives in America, England, Germany, Italy, all over the world, finding this man in um, India that they can gather around and throw off the yoke of what's expected of the programming and so forth and go into the state of bliss. <clears throat> and there's one point in this film, and I bring it up for purpose, that one of the key characters, without giving too much away, is faced with a death mm. and told, it's over now. And you see her at in the day, at the event, decades ago, all blissed out and mm. because she smiles, it's a celebration. Then you see her talking on camera as an older woman, crying. This was the most devastating moment in my life. Yeah. And having to stuff it, stuff it, stuff it. That's not an uncommon signature mm -hmm. in what has been a lot of the new age movement yeah. is to stuff it, detach from it. And it's caused a lot of harm for people and can even slip over into delusion at times. Yes. yes. You see? And I, I definitely, you know, I can look back on my life and see times when I thought that was true. Like, oh yeah, this is going to move me away from suffering rather than me being willing to befriend suffering right? And, and figure out how to deal with it. And it just goes to show, I think, I think what that um, amazing television series shows is how unequipped we are to deal with pain in our training. 
Like exactly. from childhood, it's like people have been, you know, oh, soothe the discomfort, distract the child. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's kind of just how, how we were all raised. So then we're completely on our own as adults trying to figure this out. And I think that's why a lot of people give their power away to gurus or slightly dodgy spiritual teachers who are running their own wounds through this idea that they're embodying something for everybody. But also you just said a really key thing. One of my biggest awakenings happened in 2009. And awakening is for me an experience where just everything opens out and they can happen in very small moments and they can be really big things. For about, oh, I don't know, maybe it was seven or eight days, I had absolutely no fear like nothing and it was marked it was like i didn't know what had happened it was just it was gone there was a sequence of events that led up to it and it was this boom and in that moment i could see so many things that i couldn't normally see and i started to put a plan in place for my for my next kind of decade right and then i crashed so i i really thought wow everything i'm i'm completely <laughs> this is that state they all talk about yeah. And then within about three, four months, the life I knew just was, was kind of ripped out from under me. And as a result, I went into the biggest pain release of my life that I know I wouldn't be, that I now stand on the shoulders of. So I think often the awakening and the euphoria and the pain, they're just, they're different ends of the same scale. And, right. and, and to know that we can go between those is is really important yeah it's almost like a manic depressive mm -hmm. um dynamic on the spiritual level yes and so you the, uh, probably the greatest existential question in the crisis that most people have when they're finding their way toward you and others and disease to help give guidance in life is what am i here for mm -hmm. and i hear this all the time mm -hmm. i hear this from people who have retired. Mm -hmm. They've been through their life mm -hmm. in terms of the, their earning years and so forth. They've raised their kids and just, just don't know what I'm really supposed to do. And I'm thinking, still? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, alrighty then. What is it that, that the Zs believe and you have come to understand that keeps people from knowing that answer? And then secondly, from actually beginning to integrate with that? Um, fear of their own power but also some dysmorphic idea uh, that leads them to inaction. So, for example, uh, I have had many times over the last decade where my human mind will go, I'm not sure what I'm doing. I don't know why I'm here. And then I'll have someone else say to me, wow, you've got this amazing purpose. You're... So it's all perception. Yeah. And I think everybody has those moments. And it's not that those moments are a problem. It's whether or not we... we don't investigate them and what's underneath them mm -hmm. or whether or not we just go, oh, I'm just tired. Today I'm tired. So my mind is giving me all the wrong signals because right. my body's off balance. And I, I can see that. Um, but I think for a lot of people, they think that purpose is far bigger than it is, especially because like we said, with what we were just talking about with LA, we've all been told, oh yeah, be a billionaire and have a yacht and yeah. all these external things that people the then sat on their yacht mm -hmm. crying, going, why do I feel so miserable? Um, and that often that success is, is, is what really helps people go to therapy because there's like depression. That's the depression big crash. You, you've got it all supposedly, yeah. but you don't have it. So and if, yeah, when so, you really reach that degree of success, that's a wonderful point to start asking absolutely. questions. Absolutely. Yeah. So I think, I think for me, the people who I meet who are very locked in that, what I tend to see in their energy field is, um, a lifetime of reinforced disempowerment either by people around them who just never supported them, loved them, gave them positive affirmation right. that they have then ingrained in themselves. You know, it's like when you see that person and you're like, wow, you look beautiful, Jane. Oh, no, I don't. No, no, I really don't. And it's like, and you go, no, no, you really do. Jane, you, I think you look gorgeous. No, 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 I don't. Like, she ain't, she ain't coming over the side that you're, you're at. She's right. like, no, this is, this is the pattern I'm embedded in. And I think some people get addicted to the discomfort that they're feeling and it becomes a pattern that they get stuck in and they don't know how to take an action to step out of it. So what I always would, or what I would mm -hmm. say in that question, in that question that you ask is then do some stuff, yeah. but don't think Try. that doing it yeah. is going to make you, don't think that you have to feel something when you do it, just start, write a list of all the things you're going to do that you think might be purposeful in the next 30 days and then ask for some feedback from people around you 
this is what I did. What did you think of it? Because you just might have a, a, this dis-ease in your body that is, is going to take a repatterning through action and doing something purposeful for you to start to feel that joy. I think sometimes we think the feeling should be there. Yeah, I agree with you. And I think what you touched on a little bit ago is true, too. The support isn't there from the outside. Mm -hmm. And when you think of a lot of the people that live in, say, this environment where they seemingly have it all, where they've attained the wealth or position or whatnot, oftentimes that's, that's even supported less mm -hmm. than a person who's doing their day-to-day -day job. Yeah. because there then becomes comparison, envy, and so forth. So each person that really starts trying to climb up into their highest potential oftentimes meets resistance from the very people around them. It's and true. this is a big human dynamic that we have to learn collectively. It's true. Value judgments, competition, comparison. Mm -hmm. And um, I think it's one thing that we're all talking about with social media. I, you know, I, I, I know I have done it where you go on Instagram and you're like, oh, wow, you know, and you see something or so, and your mind tells you a story about it. And I'm the one good, the one thing Their I have. Their life up is my, so perfect. I know. <laughs> but the one thing I have up my sleeve is if I notice a thought like that is, I know that it's never it's never that way. I mean, I've met enough people or had people say things to me about how I must have felt when something <laughs> happened. And I'm like, oh no, I didn't feel that at all. I was just hoping that the event went well, you know? Right. So so I think we're just we're so we're so interesting and contradictory and you can never really know what someone's insides are based on the perception or the projection you're putting on that. Oh, absolutely not, yeah. especially social media. Yeah. You know, it's essentially one's personal, they call it in the industry, sizzle reel. Right. Highlights yes. reel. Yes. Yes. <laughs> it's yes. like, no, that's yeah. not how you woke up this morning. Um, we want to get to channeling in just a little bit. I have, okay. well, way too many more questions here, but let's just talk about the, the question of soul groups, mm -hmm. because that's really where that can come together for you yeah. is when you connect with your soul family or soul group where you can learn to help each other rise to your highest potential. Yes. So you know those people that you meet and you know I know we have this and I'm sure many people watching have this too where you meet them and you're like oh my god I know you yeah. and I've just met you and I don't know why I know you and I think there there's a trap that I see that can happen when people meet those people especially if it's romantic relationship. You know, there's this whole, there's this very trendy, have I met my twin flame? Have I met my twin soul thing right. that I tend to see leading people to pain and suffering. I don't tend to see it enhancing people's lives because then if their twin flame moves away or their twin soul doesn't say yes, they think they've missed their opportunity because they're right. so fixated very on that. True. So with soul groups, what tends to happen is some people, it's just like that famous saying, someone will be in your life for a lifetime. Uh, is it, a, I, I, don't, I forget the phrase, but it's like I a lifetime, phrase, a season I, I or can, a reason. Right, exactly. And it's the same with your soul group. Yeah. Someone could come in, it's a, you feel this energy about it, and it's like, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm in my grid. Like this is someone from my grid who I was meant to meet at this time, and there's something that's going to happen. And it might be a short thing, it might be a long thing. So soul groups are the people that you meet that not only you connect with for personal reasons, but that your coming together creates this alchemical response in your lives yeah. or in your communities. Um, not to be crude about it, but it's kind of like uh, the orgasm reaction in sex when you right. meet someone like that. Right. It's like, oh, this, this energy comes out of the two of you that can create something. Right. And don't necessarily label it immediately. Yeah. <laughs> because that's what people are... I know a couple of people doing that right now. And it's like, oh, you're such wonderful people, but don't put labels on it the first few days. Yes, you know? yes. Yeah. And I, I, I mean, I think, I think because it's a romance, whether you're having a romantic relationship. Yeah. Or a friendship, I, it doesn't matter. I was that person who would go, oh my God, I've met this person. <laughs> like, you know, so I, you, do, you learn the hard way from those though. Absolutely. Yeah. Are you comfortable with uh, doing some channeling Absolutely. now and letting the Z's come through? Yeah. And we have some questions from your audience. And I have a couple of my own I'm going to toss in as well. So we'll hit a broad range mm. of subjects. <clears throat> hmm. Good. Welcome. Light and dark being the theme of your conversation is very pertinent at this time on Earth. Uh, we uh, look forward to your questions. Ha. Oh, boy, is it. <laughs> oh, my God. I, people have been in uh, quite a lot of turmoil um, all over the planet. It seems like the light and dark is really becoming polarized now. As the women start to stand up in their power, the patriarchy tries to slam down, clamp down on that expression, and we're seeing it 
all over the world politically with what we call strong men rising to positions of power. Can you comment on the dynamic that's driving all of this? Well, we can comment on what it uh, leaves as an end result for what is actually happening in the center of that extreme is generation of heart energy. So if you look at this polarity you describe, the light on one end and the dark on the other, uh, what many of you don't see is what is happening in the middle space because the dark is very noisy and distracting and the light is very enticing and mm, mm, entrancing. But in the center, what you are actually seeing is the rising of heart energy on the planet. And this can be through discomfort as much as through joy, uh, but people are beginning to inhabit their bodies. Uh, what we will also say is one of the reasons the darkness is getting so exposed is those who are perhaps consciously or unconsciously living in darker states, uh, they too are getting very hot under the collar as your planetary shift takes place. For what is happening on Earth is happening across the universe, uh, but the Earth is a focal point for this shift. So mm, there is a sickness on your planet that has to be healed. And until it is healed, uh, there will not be rest for any of the sentient life on the planet. And that is the fight that you are finding yourselves in the middle of right now. We will tell you that there is an enormous amount of good um, energy being generated by those on the light side. But what we would say even more so is those who are not the activists at this time for the light or otherwise are actually leading the way for those who will follow in about 20 years time who are quietly generating themselves in the middle of those two poles, dark and light. So there is a relay race at, a relay race at work to keep your planet moving in the direction that would serve consciousness and the evolution of not just humanity, uh, but in fact all of Earth. Thank you for that. Would you say that that younger generation that's coming up who are um, very young right now might be drawing from both in a more pragmatic way to actually be able to um, bring true solutions forward societally? Uh, yes, but we would like to point this out for uh, you are quite right in what you are speaking about with the younger generation, but we uh, do not want any of you who are, let's say, 50 or over to discredit yourselves. We sometimes hear uh, people, mm, shall we say, mm, mm, over heralding the young generation. The young need all of you to speak up and to speak your truth. You have a very clever mm, program in your society, which is to discredit the older people. Mm -hmm. And that, of course, is a wonderful way to get rid of your wisdom keepers. So this is very important to understand. Yes, the younger generation will lead the way, but we would actually say the only reason they will do that successfully is if those who are in the 50 and above bracket at this time really start to own and speak about their truth, whether that's through words or through action or through both. Very true. Thank you. I think a lot of it is because as things are, blame is placed on the older generations for having created it. And that blaming is what I think has, it, it's almost a, it seems to be a, an abrogation of responsibility on the part of older people thinking, ah, we had our shot, it appears we screwed up, right? But that is a little like mm, mm, accusing people who have had blinkers put onto them of not seeing the oncoming danger. Yes. For, uh, as you are well aware and many watching, uh, there is a game at work on Earth that is nothing to do with humanity, uh, meaning humanity has caught itself in the crossfire of a game that is being run. Uh, we say that not to be alarmist for any of you who uh, are confused by our words. Uh, we simply say that the reason that humanity is uh, quote unquote waking up in these times and you hear much reference to that is humanity accepted the blinkers that it was given and is now beginning to take the blinkers off. And the reason this is such a pivotal and exciting time from our perspective is the power of humans is immense, not because the human being itself is so exceptional, but because the human is able to be a receiving force for universal energy, wisdom, and light. So in a way, the human being is the receiver, but uh, you have all had your receiving abilities dampened down by some of the powers that be that wanted to take control of the planet. And the reason the dark is so polarized right now is they are sweating. Indeed, it feels as though we're turning over stones now and seeing these frightened little creatures and you shine light on it. 
recoiling and, and se yet secretly sort of controlling from the wings. And I think most people that are listening to you right now understand the dynamics you're speaking of. And if you would- We will add one yes, thing please. if we may. Uh, we understand that some of you are here as activists against the dark and voices against the dark. And that is wonderful. We do not wish to steer you away from the course that feels true for you. But we would like to assure you that most of you who feel unsure about taking on that role, uh, you generating what you are generating in consciousness is all you need to do. Meaning, if you focus on what you feel here to offer to the world, uh, whether it is healing, whether it is teaching, whatever it is that you can feel is lighting other people up and is lighting you up to do and to offer, that is enough. None of you can save the world single-handedly, but all of you cannot help the world save itself if you all get distracted by thinking your purpose should be something that someone told you it should be, rather than trusting that what is driving you internally, both on your own healing path and also to help heal others, is plenty and, in fact, more than enough. Indeed. What a beautiful planet if everyone were expressing their own divine genius, say. Eh? <laughs> so meanwhile, if we, can we take a moment and talk about the seeming rise of the feminine uh, energy? And we're looking at it even in, um, even in the headlines of the day, um, where in the United States, for example, many women, uh, many people of different uh, diverse racial backgrounds, sexual orientations have suddenly risen to positions of uh, power within the legal structures, the Congress and so forth. What, how would you describe from your point of view, what does that rise of that feminine energy actually look like from your point of view? Uh, well, we will say that from our point of view, this is all very, shall we say, foretold or destined. Uh, and most importantly, the balancing of power positions for those who are in the female body on your planet, or perhaps we should say not in the male body, uh, that is very important because the rise of the feminine now needs to take place inside men. So it is an externalized rise for those who are in female bodies, meaning they are uh, being put into more balanced positions in society rather than subservient or subjugated ones. Uh, but what is most important for the planet is men being allowed their feminine energy again and understanding that just as they have been taught to separate and subjugate and agree to let women be the, shall we say, second class as a worldwide society, so too does that mean that the feminine power they see in the same way. And so they have separated from what would make them, shall we say, advanced. And that has arrested the development of men all over the world, even those who are progressive. For even those who are progressive are held back by their peers and their group and the highest point of consciousness in a collective. So that is actually what is most exciting to us. From our perspective, we now see that the role of women on the planet is balancing enough that now the rise of the feminine energy in men is going to start. And that will be a game changer for all of you. And when you speak of the rise of that in men, you've referred to in times past, you're speaking about the forces, for example, of creativity and open heartedness, which have been very difficult through the reasons you've mentioned a moment ago for men to openly access. So you're saying the rise of the feminine will give permission almost for a man to start examining and letting forth the messages of the heart and his creativity in a new way. Every man, as we see it, has mm, intuition, emotion, sensitivity, and flow. But very few men have developed that to a high degree because of the way they have been disinvited from it. So that is what we mean. Uh, this ability to flow in a non-combative or mm, aggressive way. Uh, aggressive can be a harsh word, uh, but again, we are not judging any men for this. It is simply the paradigm that both men and women have agreed to play out up until now. So as women are allowed to become, shall we say, more driven, uh, more ambitious, and we use very male words there for a reason, because those are words that have so often mm, 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 women have been chastised for being, as they are allowed to do that, men are allowed to become more sensitive, more feeling-based, more caring, more loving. And what we will show you here is, think of a group of men that you know who are all friends, and you might see them as, mm, if you are in America, you might call them jocks. If you are in England, you might call them group of lads. If you actually watch these men closely, 
they are dying to love each other. And we do not mean in a sexual way, but they are dying to love each other. And they do it through whacking each other on the arm and they do it through all kinds of ways. But what you are actually watching is a deep energy of love between these groups of men. And yet they are also having to navigate all of the barriers where they have been told they cannot love each other. So as that starts to break down, men are allowed to be more compassionate more of the time less of the destruction on the planet is allowed to continue. That's really interesting. And just as an aside, I remember watching the end of a British rugby match where the British team had won. And at night in the bar, two of the lads um, had their jumpers on and they were punching, drinking beer and punching each other in the stomach. And the whole thing was to punch as hard as they could without the other one showing any emotion or pain. And I thought this was one of the oddest displays of affection and (laughs) joy at winning a match, but it's exactly what you're speaking to. And you are brilliantly describing the initiation that boys have in the playground at school. Yes, very true. Um, Okay, this brings us, we were talking about uh, sexuality a moment ago. This brings us to the subject of new gender identifications or unidentifying gender-wise in such a broad a way that we, most people can't even keep up with all of the new ways of identifying oneself. What is that doing from your side? What is that offering humanity to disconnect from the basic categories that have been until now? It is very important because you are a very physicalized world. So we will give you another scenario. Uh, You could rewind the clock some to times where things were a little looser and a little less ordered around sexuality, sexual expression, gender expression. And uh, anybody can be anything. Mm, Doesn't mean everybody is, but there are permissions for anybody to be whoever they are, whatever body they are in. The reason that there are so many now beginning to feel they are born into the wrong body or they need to change their body to change their gender identification is because that is the way that the world will wake up to unification. Uh, It could have been a very different way. It could have been if you were not living through the time you are living through, then people's consciousness would have a different way of expressing themselves rather than needing to feel that they were born into the wrong body. You see, what we actually see in all of that is uh, the fact that uh, all of you have been trained to follow hard and fast rules about what certain bodies and certain genders are. And we would say that that is the error that society is having to deal with. However, uh, you do not see it that way. None of you do, uh, not even the most progressive among you. So therefore, This reassigning of gender identification is a wonderful opportunity uh, for people to physically and mentally have to start to mm, re-examine what they thought being human, being a woman, being a man is and was, and to open up their senses. And for that purpose, many souls chose to come to the earth at this time and literally to feel they were born into the wrong body because that is part of their mission on earth for the wider planet, even though they may not see it that way. They may just be in their own personal uh, quest for what they need to do with and for their life. So mm, that is how we would explain it from our perspective. That's very interesting. Thank you. We have a question from Lorene, and she's asking, why does it seem so hard for most of us to connect with our higher consciousness? And what's your best advice on how to do that? Well, we would say that practice makes perfect, to coin one of your mm, mm, phrases, but with a big caveat. Uh, It is very easy to access your higher consciousness when you are focused on higher consciousness with a group of people or in a place where it is free to be higher consciousness serving. Uh, You see, you do all tend to work on collective energy. So one of the things that many of you come across is that you can access higher consciousness by yourself, privately, in a workshop, with a book. And then you go out into the world and you think you have lost it. You haven't lost it at all. You have just gone into a more dense interaction, a more dense environment, and you are kicking and blaming yourself for not maintaining higher consciousness rather than recognizing, hey, this person is of a really low vibration. So of course I cannot keep my higher consciousness. 
And again, this is not to judge them or credit you. It is simply to understand that this planet is not at higher consciousness all of the time. So cultivating higher consciousness practices that will sustain you throughout the day is very important. It is why some people choose to meditate for two hours a day, and then they can deal with the crazy, but it doesn't mean that they aren't mm, empty in their tank 24 hours later when they need to meditate for two hours again. So we would say to you, cultivate your practices, but also pay close attention to the environments, people, and consciousness you are interacting with before you judge yourself for losing your height of consciousness. Mm. It is so fast that all of you can change wherever your attention or your energy is. Uh, that can change you in an instant. So be mindful of that. Wonderful. Thank you. Here's another question from a member of the audience. Are there circumstances in our lives which we cannot change due to these issues being predetermined in our birth or astrology charts? And how do we ride the wave when there are challenges that won't seem to budge? Uh, yes and no, meaning there are certain predetermined lessons and life journeys for people, uh, but you have the opportunity with all of those lessons, for many of you they repeat over and over again, to move up the ladder and move out of being stuck. Uh, in your case, uh, what we would suggest to you, and this may be relevant to others, uh, for it is a universal question for many people, is to think about the part of you that feels guilty about changing your pattern, changing your old story. Would you be letting down the other people involved or your family if you moved beyond carrying this for them? Or would you feel that you are somehow divorcing yourself from the past if you create a new future? So we would say to you that it is important to understand that while there are certain challenges or challenges that are not just in your chart, but that can show up at any point in life, you can always be elevating the way you respond to them. But this tends to need both healing on the issue itself and repatterning and focusing forward to move between those two poles in order to create actual change rather than simply desiring change or feeling desperate about change. And this is directed to the person who has asked that question. It is, but it is clear. wider too. And wider too, yes. yes. Okay, here's another one. How can we concentrate on raising, I think a lot of people feel this, raising our own vibration when it feels like we're ignoring or turning a blind eye to the suffering and struggle of others? Well, this is a very good question for those of you who are concerned about turning a blind eye to the suffering or struggle of others. You tend to be taking on a little too much responsibility in that area. Uh, and you are not the kind of people who become mm, flaming sociopaths. Uh, the very fact that you're even thinking about the suffering of others or aware of the suffering of others is very important for you to understand that your world will go between the two. So as you cultivate and sustain yourself and your own growth, you will naturally turn back toward the part of you that wants to be benevolent in some way. So we are big advocates of not necessarily ignoring the suffering around you, but understanding that if you try to serve the suffering all around you all the time without also filling yourself back up, you will soon be serving no one. But if you are concentrating and focusing on filling up yourself and sometimes having periods where you cultivate yourself in a different way and perhaps step away from your responsibility to helping, healing or alleviating the pain of others, that can be a very good thing for your soul. And the last thing we will add is when it's an emergency for you to help with suffering in a person or a place, you will know. Uh, you cannot miss somebody in your area who needs help because they will call you and speak to you in a way that your body will make you run toward them or toward the event that you feel you need to be an activist around. So we would say lean into filling up yourself if you are in indecision and see how comfortable or uncomfortable you are with that. Because sometimes you stop yourself doing it thinking you need to serve the suffering in the world because you are actually a little scared of what's going to happen when you deeply give to yourself. Indeed, in a very crude sense, it's the saying, put the oxygen mask on yourself first. True. <clears throat> okay, here's another one. How do you keep moving forwards with your dreams and goals when things are not turning out the way you think they will and the fear starts creeping in? 
Well, we would say uh, if you are moving towards your dreams and your goals and fear isn't creeping in, you're doing it wrong. <laughs> uh, for Remember that when you have a new dream or a new goal, and that tends to be what a dream or a goal is, something new, some new level, some new experience, you don't tend to have a dream or a goal of something you've already done. Uh, then you are going to see for yourself there will be emotional movement, there will be psychological movement, there may be physical movement that needs to take place in order for you to achieve that dream or goal. So we would say that what many people do is they tend to give themselves very, very big aims and then get overwhelmed when they can't make those aims work. So think of your goal with a slightly more architectural mind. Perhaps you have a big two-year goal well, if you just leave that there, it's going to be very difficult for you to mm, mm, walk towards that goal. But if your two-year goal uh, has six or seven steps that you have also plotted along the way, you have recognized that in order to achieve your goal of moving to Hawaii in two years' time, you are going to need to perhaps save some money. You are also going to need to be open to other sources of abundance to help support you. You are also going to need to start to close down on a certain work interaction that you have over the next six months. You can achieve your goals and your dreams by literally looking at them step by step and breaking them down so that they are slightly more achievable and bite-sized, not just for you to build the thing, but for you to deal with the change that is going to happen in you as you move into the thing. Good advice, thank you. Another one here, we're all at different levels of development, and I know that this comes up in the book as well, Energy Speaks. We're at different levels of development, humanity at large, and you say that that variance of our levels of development actually helps us all move forward more effectively. Can you speak to that? Because a lot of times people get into judgment about, oh, this person is just not evolved and so forth, you know? Yes, and we would caution against uh, that kind of mm, linear judgment for yes. you don't really know the purpose that person is serving or what they are doing off to the left when you aren't paying attention to them. This is why you can never really fully see another person for each person is a multidimensional world and at best, you might be seeing three to eight aspects of their multidimensional world in that moment you are focusing on them. And then of course, when you are focusing on them, that causes a chemical reaction in them. Uh, we will put it this way. Uh, you might walk away from an interaction with somebody and you are thinking, that was a very angry person. But that person might not be angry to everyone else. That is just the effect you had on them. Ha! Huh. So this is very important to understand. Everyone is here to help you and you are here to help everyone else. At what we see, uh, what you might call higher levels, we just call it levels free of the body, uh, everyone is a soul doing what they are here to do on the planet. But on the human personality level, in the more defined, dense aspect, you all see sometimes what you need to see in another person, but also you all take on different roles so that you can be in the world as it is. So whatever you don't like about your world, you could list out 10 things you don't like about the world in general, and then you will probably list 10 different character types you don't like. But the thing is, the contrast, as many of you know, is what gives you an experience of the opposite effect. So from our perspective, there is no higher or lower in terms of the souls on this planet. But in terms of the consciousness being run through different personalities at different times, that is variable. Uh, just as many of you will recognize some days or as moments you feel very high consciousness and others you realize you are dealing with a lower part of yourself. Indeed. Thank you. Any final words um, before we sign off here? Uh, we would like to say to all who are in this time, uh, you will have heard us sometimes say this is an exciting time to be alive. You will have also heard us sometimes say this is an intense time to be alive. And both are true. But what we would like to remind you is that this coming decade of time is a very important one for Earth. And we say that not to denigrate any other decade. Uh, but what we mean is you are going to see a great deal of revolution and evolution taking place across the planet in very unpredictable ways. And we would like to uh, reiterate that word unpredictable. We say this because there are a myriad of conspiracy theories and potential timelines that everyone is convinced is going to happen. We would like to say none of it is going to happen in any way that you have read about or have uh, feared. Instead, what you are in is a very fertile time where as things are somewhat falling apart in certain areas, 
there is a renaissance beginning for the way that humanity wants to mm, steward their role on this planet in the coming decades. So be willing to be surprised by what you see around you. And whenever you are going into fear about the future, uh, remember you don't know yet because you aren't there. That is the way that you render yourself inactive. And at this time in history, it is most important that all of you are building new pathways, whether that is in what you are creating for the world or whether that is the new way you are creating a conversation with an old friend. You will all find that through leaning into birth and creation energy all the time or as much as possible, you are going to feel more alive in these wired times. And we would say to any of you who are feeling stuck, depressed, low, down, these are very intense energies. And if that hits you for more than, uh, say, five or six days at a time, that is a call to action that you need help, whether that be through your friends, through a healer, through a therapist, you cannot do this alone for something has got stuck and lodged in you. And if you aren't able to unpick it yourself, get some support for these are fast times, but equally you can open out and progress as fast as you can heal the wounds. So for those of you who are feeling a little stuck in the wounding, it is very important when you catch yourself there to ask yourself, what help do I need and what actions must I take to support this heavy difficult, wounded part of myself, for there is more in you than the wound. And when you get in touch with that higher aspect of you that wants to parent you into a wider way of being, then you will start to bring in the people, the support, and the tools necessary to move you out of your history and into your new future. Mm. So That's beautiful. Might you also say then, uh, this is absolutely the best time to begin to identify those sparks of desire and the divine genius within ourselves. No better time to begin expressing that. Absolutely. And to surround yourself with as many people as you can who make you feel lit up inside, whether it is because they make you laugh, whether it is because they are inspiring. It doesn't really matter what they are doing that is making you feel lit up, but the fact they are lighting you up is the key. Ziz, thank you so much for joining us here. And there are thousands of people watching live right now. So this has been really lovely. We appreciate your wisdom. A thank pleasure you. and thank you. And here we are. Yeah. <laughs> we are just about out of time. I, I think I stretched it a little bit. I hope you're okay with that. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> no, there was a lot of really good information in that. And I think you're right. We were talking, before we came onto this live event, we were talking here off camera about how March of this year has just been mm. a soul kicker for mm -hmm. people. So many people feeling like they're just shredded emotionally. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and psychically and so yeah. forth. So what a good message to come through at that moment. Yeah, and I, and I think going, going into that, it, it is, these are intense times yes. of growth. And so it can be great, but it can, you know, the intensity, it, I think the, the most empowering thing that I've learned to remember is if you're going through something, so is at least a handful of other people. <laughs> if not, I'm always blown away by if I have a week of big growth, I'll speak to a few different friends mm -hmm. and they'll be like, oh my God. And I'll be like, oh, because you, you can get very, I think the most dangerous thing for us is to get locked in our own minds about thinking it's just us. I so, think so too. Yeah. We are not alone no, not in challenging all. times. Not at all in so many ways. Lee, I think we're about wrapped up here. And so anything you wish to say? Yeah, thank you so much thank for doing you. this and for being so brilliant with all your questions. And um, thank you to all of you who chose to watch. And if you are new to the fabulous Regina, reginameredith.com is where yes. they can find all of your work. Yeah, They can find half my work on reginameredith.com and I still have my other day job, which is Gaia. Absolutely. It's an amazing show and Regina Open has Minds. so many great guests on Open Minds and yeah. Gaia. Gaia.com. Is that the yes. URL? Mm -hmm. Yes. Gaia.com okay. and you'll see, I think, three or four interviews with you. We did five. Five. I okay, know. five. Yep. I stand yep. corrected. Yep. <laughs> um, so, um, so thank you for tuning in. And if, if you're new to me, you've stumbled on this, you can find all of my work at leeharrisenergy.com. And, um, I do monthly energy updates that kind of help, hopefully help us all cope yeah. with what's going on where I kind I try and make it grounded, uh, what's going on energetically. So they're always free on YouTube, but the best place to find me 
And all of my work is leeharrisenergy.com. So thank you everyone for tuning in. Thank you to Noah who's been running this broadcast for us and um, big love everyone. You have been listening to Impact the World. For more of my work, please visit leeharrisenergy.com. This August, I'm doing something a little bit different. From the 18th to the 26th, me and my team are bringing to you a virtual soul magic experience. We've run soul magic retreats for the last four years, and we would have been going to Costa Rica this October for our fifth one. But because we can't, and also because I've been feeling a calling to hand over the microphone to my guides, the Zs, a little more of late, we have created a brand new experience for you called Transmissions 2020. In it, there will be five live broadcasts which will be entirely channeled. These broadcasts will focus on you accessing more of your magnetic energy. I've chosen to broadcast all of these live because that way I know the material will be specially curated for those of you who show up to take this experience with us. Added to this, we have for you a special music album, and it's sound healing pieces from Devor Bozik with my spoken words weaved throughout. And when you do sign up, the first track from the Transmissions sound healing album will be available for you immediately. So to find out more about what Transmissions 2020 entails, you can visit transmissions2020.com and if it resonates for you to take this special journey with us, we'll look forward to welcoming you there.